It's been a while, longer than I expected. I wanted to come forward once more and talk about the hunts I've been on and the things I've learned. Truth be told, I don't think I'm ready to dive into the details. All I can do right now is sit and think about the pieces I've gathered that belong to a puzzle that I've yet to make sense of. Rest assured, I'm out there, taking care of the dirty work. If something needs to be hunted, I will hunt it. I thought at the very least, after all this, I could come forward and talk briefly about what I did after I last left you. I'd also like to share something intimate with you, if my suspicions about the ever-evolving world around me are correct. I want you to know why I do this. I'm sure enough of you have figured out that in my previous life, I was married. There are switches that are flipped in everyone's life that can define the path we take. The switch that led me to this job was the night I lost my wife. But before I dive into that, just a quick update on how I've been since my last encounter with Iris. That's what I've come to call the being I previously referred to as the Purple Man. It sounds less hokey. When I left you, I discussed that I was going to take a break, and while that was true, I had some things to take care of before doing so. First and foremost was to ride back to the incident site to make sure nothing too damning was left behind. Not surprisingly, there wasn't a body to be seen. Even the jobbins that lured in Bigfoot had since dispersed, which is admittedly unlike their behavior. I've seen a number of people who followed along with my experiences, who voiced their concern that Iris might have survived. I can't comment on that one way or the other, but returning to the scene, it was clear he fought back. Clumps of brown fur were stuck to surrounding trees. I'm not sure if he's out there, but it's hard to imagine that if he made it out alive, that he'd be in very good shape. Upon returning to the scene, I cleaned up what I could and headed out from there to speak with any local hunters I could find. Anyone who would listen agreed that they would keep their eye out for Iris and get a hold of me if anything was spotted. So far, nothing has come up. A few false flags that might have been misinterpreted sightings of the beast, like the Mile Wolf, Westland Bears, or even Dogman. Something of an apex himself. With the word spread as far as I could get it, I brought Elvis into the shop and handed a great deal of money to the mechanic, sorted my affairs, and then bought the plane tickets too. Well, let's say somewhere warm. Funny how you can go your whole life without seeing a cryptid, but when you start noticing them, it's hard to stop. While I was on my vacation, trying my damn best to actually relax, I couldn't help but spot things. The type of stuff I would normally use to track a cryptid, like bizarre tracks lining the beaches, or the soft hum coming from the water. I managed to get through my trip without intervening too much. Most of the cryptids that I assumed were there were typically harmless. The hum, however, was something I needed to step in and handle. I'm not too well versed on the aquatic ones, as there's not many in my hunting radius, but the hum was something any hunter is familiar with. I was staying in a location by the beach, so when the night was silent and the crickets were tempered, you could hear the hum. It sounds like a disc whirring up in your computer, a constant and flat noise. The danger comes when you can't hear it. If the hum is there and you pick up on it, then your brain distinguishes it as something that is just noise. When you don't hear it, however, Similar to the Jobbins call, it can affect your waking process. There is something referred to as the call of the void. 
It's a moment in our brain that emphasizes intrusive thoughts. For example, if you were at the top of a tall building and you looked down, your brain might create an urge to jump. The feeling is fleeting, and because it's so swiftly dismissed, you can refuse the urge. Within the hum, when it isn't being consciously perceived, it creates this effect and locks it so you can't dismiss it. So if you're standing on the beach, looking out at a vast, dangerous sea, and this call of the void is created, you will advance towards the sea. It was something I needed to take care of, or at least that's how I saw it. It's entirely possible there was a hunter local to that area, but I didn't know for sure. So taking it upon myself, I waited for the night to swallow the sky with my supplies, the third night on vacation. When it arrived, I left my hotel and trotted down to the beach with the trap in hand. As I got closer to the water, the hum began to be muffled out by the water rushing to the beach, and I did my best to focus on the hum. When the shivering water had reached to my knees, I placed a styrofoam cooler into the water with a small tap. I watched the cooler drift further and further away from me as it was directed by the waves. Within the cooler, I had placed a few pounds of spoiled fish. The stench of the fish would be enough to be picked up by aquatic life with a strong sense of smell. I wasn't going to get the chance to see her, which was a shame. I've never seen one in person. The Nereid is a very important part of the ecosystem, and the hum it emits is typically only meant to lure fish in. Unfortunately, the population of Nereids has gotten so low that sometimes you'll find one without a pack that travels too far inland. That's when they become hazardous to humans. The cooler would float out until the Nereid located it. She'd rip through the styrofoam and gobble down the fish. Stuffed inside the fish are small glass beads that contain just enough sulfuric acid to burn the Nereid's insides. I normally try to find the most humane way to kill a cryptid, if I have to. But as I said, aquatics aren't exactly my forte. It would only take a few minutes before the acid ate enough of her insides and she'd die moments later. Once the cooler was dragged under the water's surface, I waited for all traces of the hum to be extinguished. The vacation went smoothly after that, and the nights were a little more silent. And once a dozen of those nights had passed by, my time off was done. My body was rested, the bruises I suffered had cleared, and the wounds I had suffered had closed. The whole plane ride back home, I couldn't help but wonder what was waiting for me. I had pictured a dizzying number of messages left on my answering machine. I wondered if anyone had sighted Iris. When I returned, however, the cabin was still, and the air was unsullied, like it had been frozen in time, awaiting my return. I went a few rounds with the punching bag to prepare my body for the work ahead. Even if no one had attempted to contact me, there would be no doubt that a plethora of inquiries was waiting for me. I've been gone for two weeks. Even when one hunter takes some time off, it creates a deficit. The balance between the numbers of hunters and cryptids is fragile. If you recall, after my hunt of Iris, I had to bleed myself of the Salem's child's blood. Well, that process is still ongoing. There is less of it now but it's taking longer than expected. I'm not completely positive, but it's almost as if my blood is acclimating and reproducing the blood of the Salem child. I can't really feel the burning in my veins anymore, but on a dark enough night, there's a faint glow running through me, so that's something I'll need to research. But other than that, upon my return to the cabin, everything was peaceful. The days that followed, initially, seemed pretty routine, but as I went on, 
The tunnel vision I've had up to this point started to fade. My body and my soul had a moment to rest, and with this vigor, I was able to start seeing a bigger picture. There's something more, an underlying factor of hunting cryptids that I don't have a complete understanding of yet, but I'm getting close. Until I have something more concrete to bring you, I'm going to leave you with this. Since it happened, many nights have passed. The days turned into months until they gave birth to years. Some nights, I can't recall the date, but other nights, the numbers etch into my head like an itch I can't scratch. I had just gotten out of a match. It was a match I had won, but if you were to look at me, you would think otherwise. She picked me up in her truck. It was a much nicer one than what I'm driving around now. She was far too kind for me. I come limping out of the building with the scraps I earned as prize money clutched in my hands. Leaving the truck, Elise let me rest my weight on her as she swung the passenger side door open and helped me inside. I remember how it felt to rest my head on the seat, the cool leather pressing against thin runs of drying blood. We didn't say much. She climbed inside and started to drive home. It turns out I was as good as fighting outside of the ring as I was when I was in it. It was a conversation we had a million times before. We were both going over it in our heads as the lights of the truck led us home. She wanted to turn to me and say, You need to stop being so reckless. It would be futile. I would have just responded with the same runaround about how it was my body and that I could take it. I don't even think that was true. I couldn't see myself the way she did in those days. Looking back on it, I wish I would have listened. Maybe then, I would have been driving that night. Whenever I stepped in the ring, I would hear the crowd chanting my nickname, The Rally, what they called me. Every match, just when you thought I couldn't take any more punishment, I would come off the ropes and I would explode. She hated that I would let myself get beat down every night just for the sake of winning. I thought I was invincible back then. I'd get up in the morning and stare at the wounds I received in the ring like they were badges of honor. I was Apex. After the matches, though, I would have to do mental gymnastics to convince myself that I would even wake up the next day. She did too. I asked her to marry me years before, back when I had grace and subtlety, both in the ring and out. I don't remember when I stopped being that guy, but she put up with me far longer than she had to. Thank you for that. The road we took home is more familiar to me now than it could have ever been back in those days. The long stretch of smooth and hardly touched black pavement that cut through the forest, trees reaching out into the road as if they were trying to reclaim it. Even the moon had its trouble piercing through the thicket. I wonder of the sorts of beasts that watched our truck cut through the still night with malintent. It could have been any of them. My eyes were glued, watching the tree line zipping by us, but I could faintly see Elise's reflection in the window. She was leaning forward, and it looked like her eyes were squinting. Jack, do you see that? She whispered. Her thoughts had pushed past the fight that was brewing under our tongues. With a sharp sting that radiated through my body, I did my best to sit up so I could see clearly out the windshield. My eyes were naturally drawn to the beam of the headlights, but with Elisa's direction, I looked to the distance. Down the road and through the canopy of trees, I could see two red orbs hanging side by side. They rested near what would be the top of the trees. It looked like something was perched and watching our truck. Brake lights, I positioned, thinking that possibly the road elevated further on 
and there was another car ahead of us. Even I didn't believe the words as they slipped through my busted lips. I don't think... There was a loud clack, like erasers, smacking together and her words were cut short as her foot lifted from the gas and slammed down on the brakes. As I started leaning forward from the sudden stop, I could feel her arm press against my chest. Her and the seatbelt worked together to keep me in my seat as the tires screeched on a blacktop, nails on a chalkboard. The truck continued to skid across the road for several feet before eventually slowing and stopping. The contents of that truck had been thrown around and the air was thick with the smell of burnt rubber. We were both breathing heavily. Are you okay? Elise managed to muffle out through gaping breath. Not the one to fall from my macho act. She reached over before I even responded to unbuckle my seatbelt. She lifted her hands to my face, soft and gentle hands, with a grasp on my face. She swiveled my neck slowly. Does that hurt? Not any more than it did before, I replied, with my body becoming calmer. I had taken a mean right hook that I thought was going to spin my head completely around. Donnie Anderson, that guy had a devastating right hook, wasn't even his dominant hand. The warmth of her hand dissipated as she released her grip with a sigh. Thank God. I'm sorry, something just... She cut herself off, with quick and jarring movements, like an intrusive memory pushed itself to the front of her head. With a bobbing head, she looked out the windshield and then quickly turned to look out the back window. She must have caught the confusion on my face when she turned back to the front. Something just fell onto the road. Stay here. She demanded as she slipped her seatbelt loose. Without protest, I watched her flee from the truck. The engine hummed as she paced around it. I didn't think anything of it. Maybe a deer had run by or a bird had just dropped onto the road in front of us. During the abrupt stop, the tires had lost their traction, and so the truck began to pivot on the road, where it rested. The headlights were beaming into the forest with the truck practically blocking both lanes. Sitting up straight, I focused on the forest, looking as far as I could through the trees, expecting some critter to be looking back. I saw something shift through the trees, moving slow and quiet towards the road. It was like a predator hunting its prey. The headlights only caught small glints of it, so I couldn't make it out no matter how hard I focused. Holy shit! Elise exclaimed, just as my mouth started moving, just before I was going to shout for her to return to the truck. The interruption was enough to momentarily stifle what I had just seen and I moved in my seat to see what she was seeing. Rolling down the window, I peeked my head out towards her. I was half right. On the ground was a buck. A damn big one. I wasn't much of a hunter in those days, but any hunter would have wanted to display it as a trophy. A buck that big, one I didn't think could even fit in our truck bed, had been completely devastated. All over its amber body were deep cuts and gaping wounds that barely contained what was left of its organs. The blood hadn't just pooled onto the ground, it was splattered, like a water balloon busting on the sidewalk. Something that looked like it easily weighed over 500 pounds had been thrown onto the road, and even worse, at us. Elise, get back in the truck. I practically shouted, but she was already backing away from the buck. When she turned to run, she froze in her tracks, and in response, I heard a huff from the other side of the truck. It sounded like a horse that was preparing to throw its rider. I slowly shifted my gaze to the driver's side window. What little light I was offered cascaded onto the hunched predator 
I had briefly seen in the woods. Neither of us had any idea what we were looking at. What I now know as the Cloud Walker. They are terribly predatory creatures. Looking out the window, I could see its head, the shape of a dog's skull that was slim and veiled in pale skin. It stepped towards Elise ever so slightly, its limbs clicking against the road. The arms and legs resembled the wings of a bat and how they articulated to facilitate its movements. It was like someone took a dog's body and began switching out its parts. The limbs even had loose skin where they bent. She was afraid, as was I. The cloud walker halted its advance and buckled backwards, its limbs closing like a clamp. I shot a word glance to Elise before the cloud walker barreled forward, its body springing to life like a piston. In an instant, the blur of it had crashed down on Elise, who barely had the time to scream. Instinct and terror kicked in, and even though my body was battered and beaten, the thing seemed to operate like a tuned machine. I started to leave the truck. As the door swung open, the cloud walker's attention instantly shifted to me. Head turning like an owl, it kept a gaze focused on me, and the hooked ends of its limbs pinned Elise to the ground. Our eyes met. Me and the cloud walker engaged in a staring contest. Its eyes were deep and sunken, but glinted blue under the moonlight. I recalled that people believe cats stare at us as an attempt to prove dominance. Whether or not that's true for cats, it's true for cloud walkers. The fangs that protruded from its shut mouth like the extinct Smilodon were dripping small drops of Elise's blood. With all the hits my face has taken that night, my eyes were pained and swollen. I could only faintly hear the cries of Elise. In such a short time, she had been battered more than any night I had in the ring. The feeling that if I blinked, I lost. Felt as if it was washing over me until every other sensation was numb. The night was still, and I was locked into the gaze of some animal I had never heard about, one that orchestrated a way to catch us, its prey. After all my nights in the ring, all the battles that I had won, I was Apex. I wasn't about to lose something as stupid as a staring contest. I was invincible. Then, just for a moment, my vision went black. By the time my eyelids opened again, the thing had already turned away from me. It raised its arm into the air, and before the plea could escape my lips, it brought it down. The movement was quick and precise. The cloud walker doesn't have much muscle mass, per se, but it still performs incredibly powerful movements. Its entire body acts like a spring. It rests and contorts to build up energy, and when needed, it fires off. While it can't slowly lift a heavy animal, it can let the energy it built up explode and throw the said animal into the road. Her pleas were gone and it turned its attention to me, but this time, it had no intent on seeing what kind of prey I was. Before its body moved enough that I would be able to see what had become of Elise, I turned away and retreated into the truck. The door slammed shut, and behind me, I heard the cloud walker leap off the ground. The cloud walker gets its name from its ability to glide, using the intense momentum created by its leaps and the loose skin webbed between the bends of its limbs, it can soar impressive distances, making it very difficult for its prey to escape, and to a cloud walker, anything is prey. The truck shook as it landed on the hood, bending the metal upon impact, like it was trying to challenge me. The cloud walker began pounding on the hood, maybe challenge isn't the right word. 
I've seen muscle heads trying to challenge people. No, the cloud walker was toying with me. Its every impact shook the truck. Cloud walkers are incredibly pale, another reason for their name. But the ends of their appendages are covered in rough green scales that act like punching gloves, absorbing the shock of its sudden impacts. Each impact was met with a huff. Each impact tore the hood into bits. The headlights started to flicker under the assault. The cloud walker's hooks pressed deeper and deeper into the hood as its rampage went on, and with the flickering lights, I could see thin layers of liquid begin to cover the scales. Looking down at the cigarette lighter, I felt gears starting to turn in my head. I began to make a huffing noise like the cloud walker and push the lighter in. The Predator has very sensitive ears that, fortunately, picked up on my mockery of it. This sent it into a fit, digging away at the front of the truck and cracking the windshield that separated us. It wasn't looking at me, but I was watching it, unflinching and without blinking. I watched the clear liquid rising up from the impacts and covering its skin. When the lights finally gave out, I pushed the door open and grabbed the warm plastic knob of the lighter. Leaving the car, I turned towards the cryptid, and with everything my lungs could afford, I howled at it, like before it bent back, and I watched firsthand as it blurred and lunged at me. It felt like a car had sideswiped me, and I had been tossed across the road my back smacking the pavement hard enough to crack in my spine. But it was already done. As soon as it collided into me, the light was pressed against its thin layer of skin. A plume of blue and orange flame moved across its body, like a shockwave scorching the earth. Huffs turned into howls as it retched back and threw its limbs around without any knowledge on how to extinguish them the whole body trembling and skin burning around the flames, licked the intricate mechanisms inside. It reeled back and attempted to jump away, but something must have snapped during the attempt, and like the buck, it crashed back onto the road. With the fires that ate away at it, the road was illuminated. I could see her lying still in the middle of the road. My body was totaled from the Cloudwalker's impact as it crawled across the road. So did I. Her hand, at her very last moments, she was reaching out to me. Fist clenched, I dragged myself closer to her, until finally allowing the tears to well up. The cool drops fell onto my beaten down hands and carried the red off the surface. Finally reaching her, all I could manage to do was rest my head on her stomach. Part of me was hoping I could feel it rise, that there was some sign of life left in her. The feeling of wetness that adorned the side of my face was enough though. There was nothing left for her to give. She was gone. As I reached the pits of my sorrow, I was enveloped by an intense light and two heavy thuds of car doors slamming shut. Help him up. I heard an old grizzled voice commanding, and then I felt hands grab my arms, and despite my meager resistance, I was pulled to my feet. Standing on my own was a great deal of difficulty, but the gentleman that appeared helped steady me. The lights of the car they left shrouded their features, but the two of them were imposing and well dressed. First off, I'm sorry. The older man spoke again. The one holding me began leading me to the car, and I was far too exhausted in every regard to fight back. But goddamn, you killed that sucker. He chuckled. I could see him looking over the cloud walker's corpse as the flames died out. Tell you what, Deegan, why don't you clean this mess up? The older gentleman gestured to the truck and the cloud walker. I'll take him. I turned to the one referred to as Deacon, 
The lights from the car now revealed his features. He had a sharp face and deep yellow eyes. His hair was ruffled under the wide and flat brim of his hat. The pale tones of his face wrinkled. Be careful out there, Jack. He whispered as he opened the door and ushered me into the passenger seat before returning to the older gentleman's side. Resting my head back, I felt the cool leather press up against the thin streaks of drying blood that ran through my hair. I watched for a while as the two men conversed. The closed windows muffled their voices. Deacon looked back at me a number of times. Each time the yellow of his eyes were more and more piercing. After several minutes had passed, the older man finally turned towards me and began walking towards the car. His face was aged. Each wrinkle looked like it had a story behind it. A geographical road map of his life painted on his face. His eyes somehow managed to be soft, betraying the gruff and commanding voice. His suit, all black, seemed to soak in the light around it. And before I knew it, he was climbing into the driver's seat. So, he spoke. This ain't going to be easy, boy. A sigh penetrated his lips, and he turned the keys until the engine kicked in. You got somewhere secluded to go for a while? His question carried the notion of a requirement. I nodded and told him about the cabin my dad owned. I used to go up there with him as a kid and watch him hunt, get drunk, and, if I was lucky, not take his frustrations out on me. He pressed on the gas, as if to acknowledge me. Deacon is going to take care of everything. He'll... He cleared his throat, as if something was trying to soften his tone. He'll bring your girl to the cabin. You can rest her there. Bury her, he meant. I could bury her there. The directions I needed to give were minimal, and within the hour, the car's headlights were pressing onto the old cabin. I hadn't been there since I was a kid, but not a thing looked to be out of place. You okay to stand on your own? He asked, and I nodded. My body still ached like something awful, but I pushed through and pulled myself from the car. I can't explain why I went along with everything they said. Part of it was the shock and maybe I just didn't think I had it in me to say no. I was submissive and confused. I'll dig a grave for... I'll dig it. I interrupted. And with a solemn gesture, we walked towards the backyard where the shovel still rested against the cabin. Muscles aching. I dug away at the dirt. Unthinking and unsure, I reached deeper and deeper. The old man seemed restless, but refused to leave. Not many people could do what you did, killing that thing and all. We call them Cloud Walkers. I stopped digging to focus on him. I asked him who we is. The conversation carried through until my dicking was complete. He told me he ran a group of people who hunted things like what killed my wife. We're currently recruiting. There's a war, and we're losing. You felt that loss tonight. Another car pulled up and flooded the backyard with light before I was able to question him further. Deacon found his way. I didn't remember the older man ever calling Deacon so I was confused how he got there, but he did as he was told, cleaned up and brought my wife. It was crude and simple, but it was better than I expected. A wooden box housed every bit of love I had. The three of us lifted it and gently lowered it into the earth. Deacon helped me fill the grave back up and shot me one more glance. Be nimble. He spoke before walking away and getting in his car. The old man rose from the stump that he was resting on and stepped in front of me. What happened to your girl? 
happens far too often. He spoke. The soft demeanor in his voice was gone, and the impact returned. Cloud walkers are no joke. His hand lifted and reached into the front of his suit. If you need a job, I can help. Simple stuff. He looked into my eyes like he was trying to read me. Just cleaning up roadkill till death stops shaking you. Reaching out his hand, clasping a small business card. And either way, we'll get you a new truck. When I took the card and failed to give a reply, he turned around and started walking back to the plumes of light. Oh! He suddenly gasped and spun to face me. What's your name, boy? Jack. Jack Isaacs. I stuttered out. Well, well. Jack Isaacs. I hope I hear from you again. His cadence was aloof, like all tension in the air had whisked away. Then, I was alone, standing in the backyard behind the cabin. The very same cabin I sit in now writing this. The very same backyard my wife and the Salem child rest in. After he left, I sulked for a while. A few weeks. He was true to his word. Within days, I woke up to a horror movie, flatbed sitting in my driveway. On the dashboard rested Elise's ring. It must have fallen off during the attack, and with everything going on, I just didn't notice. She was resting for so long, and I didn't want to disturb her, so I fashioned a chain, and now she rests by my heart, forever. When I finally got around to calling the number on the card, everything fell into place. The job, the roadkill. I set up a freezer and eventually went on my first hunt. But that's a story for another time. So there it is. One night can flip a switch you didn't know you even had, and your life becomes something new. I miss her every day. And if she hated the danger I put myself in when I boxed, oh boy, she'd be livid about this job. I know she'd be proud of me, though. She always was. There was always something in her eyes when she looked at me, like I was a legend. That's where I have to leave you for now. I promise I'm not leaving you to the wolves of the night. I and those like me will be out there. We'll be making sure that people can convince themselves that what they're reading is just another fairy tale. When I get more information, and when I have something substantial to bring you, y'all will hear from me again. <laughs>